Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 68, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. And me, Ravi Abbott. And there'll be no giggling at next week's show title when we're number 69, all right, Ravi? Okay, would it be like Leisure Suit Larry special <laughs> or something? <laughs> so thank you so much for checking out this week's show, guys. If you are new to the show, uh, this is a podcast where we talk about, you know, 8 and 16-bit machines, stuff like the Sega Mega Drive, Commodore Amiga, Sinclair Spectrum. 32-bit as well. Yeah, like the early PlayStation era, Sega Saturn. But how far do you think we can go, Dan? Like, I know on Reddit they say 2000, anything past 2000 is not retro. Well, this week we've got a very interesting guest because he does kind of, you know, span pretty much, you know, the entire era that we cover and quite a bit more. Um, This week we're going to be joined in the second half of the podcast by Ed Freeze. Now, Ed is an absolute legend. He was the Microsoft VP of Games Publishing. So, yeah, you remember kind of Microsoft. They used to do a lot of games publishing, stuff like Motocross Madness and Age of the Empires and stuff with the early DirectX stuff. Well, what came out of the DirectX? Obviously, the Xbox. Yeah, there you go. Now, this is the thing. I mean, you know, if you go on like 4chan's retro gaming um, channel on there and also Reddit, they all say, you know, the, the Xbox, original Xbox is not retro, so they don't let people talk about it. But then, you know, we look through Ed's history in this interview we've got coming up with him. The development on the Xbox started about 1998, 99. So you talk talking nearly 20 years ago now. Yeah, it's crazy. So. And uh, he's also done retro ports of big Xbox titles like uh, Halo. Back to the Atari 2600. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, we've got to get the story of that. And also, he was there, obviously, when uh, you know Microsoft launched Windows 95, a pivotal point, and that was probably the biggest product launch of the 20th century. Yeah, so we're kind of going to get, you know, Bill Gates' ideas on what happened with the Xbox and uh, what he liked and didn't like. You know, this was a big company doing business machines and kind of computers getting into the console world. So how did they cope? And also, I mean, he used to work on Excel and Word when they first started. And also, yeah. you know, there's a big rivalry between uh, Lotus 1, 2, 3, Word Perfect and... Word st- Processor Wars. <laughs> yes, <laughs> all of that. He snuck in a few cheeky little uh, digs at Lotus in the early versions of Excel. So we're going to get all of those stories. This week's special guest in the second half of the show is going to be Ed Freeze. And of course, the Retro Hour podcast would not be possible without your very generous support. Now, every week... We do some big ups to the people who make the Retro Hour Hall of Fame. These are people who've took the time and found it in their hearts to go onto our website, theretrohour.com, click on our little PayPal link on there and donate a couple of quid into the running of this show. And making the Hall of Fame this week, we want to say a massive thank you to Gareth McKee. Robinson Technology. The crew at Gothic Charm. VFX Vault Limited. And Simon Pilgrim, who've all made very generous donations to the running of the Retro Hour podcast this week. Thank you so much, guys. And if you'd like to do the same, we've made it so easy. All you've got to do, click that little link at theretrohour.com. Now, obviously, this weekend, we are gearing up for the British Podcast Awards. Yeah. It's going to be happening tomorrow when oh this show God. comes out. So, <laughs> slightly nervous wait, Ravi? Yeah, yeah. I hope... <laughs> What I'm hoping from the night is lots of drinks and lots of stupid photos and possibly our name being said once. <laughs> we'll see if that happens. Eh? So, listen, thank you if you voted in the uh, the Listener's Choice Award You know that they've been running for the last month or so. It actually closes tonight, so you can maybe sleep, sneak one in there really quickly. Uh, but, you know, we appreciate all your support, guys. Whatever happens this weekend, we're going to go along and have a good time. And I know there are going to be some other retro gaming podcasts there as well. I think the guys from... Retro Asylum are going to yeah, be there? Yeah, yeah, that should be good to pop along and see those guys. Because we always try and meet up with them, but <laughs> for some reason we always Screw end up, like, up. Yeah. missing them, don't we? It's like it's hard because like there's, there's about four or five retro shows that people go to, and depending on their location in the country, certain people go to certain ones, and it's it's hard to bump into everybody, you know? Yeah, and we're usually like six hours late or turn up on the wrong day. So. Yeah, on a Sunday <laughs> usually, that's because, yeah, we're working. Yeah. So good luck to everybody who's up for awards at the British Podcast Awards. Um, look out for no doubt, lots of drunken pictures on uh, Instagram, as posted by Ravi. Totally. <laughs> right, then, let's get into this week's stories. Now, um, this is something really cool that you found. Uh <laughs> A hilarious little device that came out in 1995, and this was kind of an early version of Google Glass. It was, but it looks like you have a utility belt on it. You've kind of got a a phone headset there, and you you look a bit like a Borg from um, Star Trek. (laughs) That's exactly what I thought when I saw it. You know, it's you've kind of got a webcam that faces out as your eye. And yeah. there's a little CRT screen that projects onto a little glass mirror that gives you apparently like a 15-inch a screen floating in front of you that you can see through it. And also there's even like a, a wrist strap with a, uh, a keyboard that you type on as well. 
I mean, I think... There's a CPU at the side and everything, and it, it, it's just a massive unit. It looks awful, <laughs> to be honest. It looks like the Power Gloves friend or brother or something. Well, you're essentially probably carrying like a Pentium 1 or a Pentium 2 PC on your belt, yeah. as well, aren't you, by the looks of this. It weighed at 1.3 kilograms, and uh, I love the name of it as well. It's called the Zybernaut Mobile Assistant. Oh, nice. So, and... Uh, how much was it, Dan, as well? I think they've, um, they've got the cost on this. It went up to £13,000, if you want to on one of these. So, obviously, it didn't take off. But um, yeah, there's a really cool video of a guy demonstrating it, and he actually he looks like he is a cyborg. Yeah, pretty much. And the but, kind of thing that I love about this is they've, they've done a nice image of this woman standing there, but they've kind of hidden the wire behind the back of her leg. She's got a massive wire trailing, so wherever you'd go, you'd have to make sure you didn't get caught on that wire. <laughs> Yeah, it's not the most inconspicuous device at the moment, is it? So. <laughs> and I, I can imagine the battery power is shocking. So. But everyone says that, you know, a lot of people assume that wearable technology is quite a new thing, but obviously this was, you know, as stupid as it looks now, it was very groundbreaking for mid-90s. I still think Google Glass looks a bit stupid. I've not seen anybody walk around with them. Maybe well, Google Glass will be retro soon. I'm not... I think they did discontinue it about two or three years ago. Yeah, it hasn't been taken up, has it? From what I heard, though, they actually they do still have a department who like kind of concentrate on it, but now they're kind of just selling it privately for a medical use. Okay, so like surgery and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. but... Um, I wouldn't I... trust a surgeon with this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll take my chances elsewhere, thank you. <laughs> but if you want to look at these pictures, it is uh, you know, a nice little uh, look at something... A little bit left field, isn't it, from the mid-90s? We'll put that in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, it's a website we've covered quite a lot on this show, definitely one of our favourite sites, and uh, we hope to cover this more in a future episode. Archive.org. Yeah, archive.org is a fabulous site. The Wayback Machine, you can go back on websites that kind of existed years ago and see what they would look like. They archive back to like 1994, 95, I think, on there. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy, and they've also got, Massive archives and repositories of like software and magazines. I think it's the biggest video archive in the world. Forget YouTube. This has more videos on it. Yeah, the magazines bit is incredible. I mean, you know, I, I go on there and pretty much every computer magazine that I used to read in the 80s and 90s, they've got the entire collection of most of them on there that you can download in PDFs and put them on your iPad. Yeah. And uh, like you mentioned, the software libraries. Now there is, a, you know, you know the Tosex project. The host, all of those, like the Commodore 64 and the Amiga. But those, are, those are every single game on one archive. Well, they're trying to do, I mean, it's not just games, it's software, it's applications, it's demos, and every different variant of them as well. So wow. if a game got hacked by, like, you know, four different cracking groups, they'd have all of those versions in there as well. It's ridiculously big. But now they've actually added a big software library of early Macintosh applications and games. Oh, nice, because I, I noticed this thing and... Uh... We know Jason Scott, he's a nice friend of ours, and he may be on the show soon. Mm -hmm. um, he was putting these games kind of online at one point, and he ended up putting all the Nintendo games online to play for free. Yeah. Which is insane, because he just said, you know, I'm going to wait for the lawyers <laughs> and just see when they kind of hit me up. Yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? I mean, it's tracking down the original copyright holders of all of these bits of software. It's like... You haven't got that many man hours and, you know, if you had a team of a thousand people, you probably couldn't do it. No, totally not. And, you know, he's even saying that old stuff that he's put on archive.org, so docu uh, text documents from BBSs, he's put up there and from 1985, he's getting copyright claims. Really? He's getting, yeah, from companies who are still annoyed about this. <laughs> I guess that's the only way that you'll ever track them down, though, because a lot of these companies have, like, you know, gone bankrupt or they've, like, you know, changed the name, like, 20 times over yeah. the years. And and there's a lot of people also saying, oh, God, I wrote this when I was 16, and you've put it on the archive. <laughs> Can you take it down, Can you please? take it down? And he's like, no way. <laughs> well, actually, when we do it, you know, eventually get him on the show, uh, there's a couple of old uh, Geo Cities websites I wouldn't mind uh, getting, you know, destroyed forever. <laughs> oh, yeah, some Angel Fire ones as well for me. <laughs> <laughs> but these uh, early Mac games, I mean, you know, I didn't really use the early Macintosh. I mean, the, I think the one I used, the earliest one, I've talked about it in the show before, was at my uh, auntie's print shop, probably in the late 80s. But this is, uh, you know, the original Mac that came out in 1984. Mm. And, uh, you know, games are... You know, we've all heard of like Ed Dark Castle and Gemstone. They've got those on there as well. And that you can actually play these in the web interface as well. And also a lot of the actual piracy, like the West Coast crackers and stuff, they all started on the Apple II. Yeah, which was a precursor to the Mac, obviously. So yeah. it's interesting just to see these, you know, 
get an experience and get a bit of a flavour about a platform that maybe you're not all that familiar with. Yeah, and if you're bored at work, this is fabulous because you can just pop it up in your browser <laughs> and play. <laughs> just remember to have Excel open, like, you know, minimize to... Uh, yeah. <laughs> you could actually... Remember, you could get, like, programs that did that, couldn't you? It would be like a shortcut on your keyboard. You and press it and bam. Yeah. The spreadsheet would appear on the yeah. screen when the boss walks past. So uh, if you want to check out these um, early Mac applications, we'll show that in our show notes this week as well. Now, we did get some very sad news last week that a true pioneer um, in the computer industry, you know, you couldn't call this guy anything less, Robert Taylor passed away at the age of 85. Now, people may not realise just how much we have to thank Robert Taylor for. Give us a few examples of a couple of the things he was involved with. Yeah, so Robert Taylor was pretty amazing. He kind of was working with NASA as a project manager and he helped fund the Stanford Research Institute who were developing the computer mouse. Right. So, you know, they <laughs> That's didn't... That's pretty big in itself. Yeah, they didn't have an input before that. And then he was working in, 19, in 1966 with the Pentagon. Yeah. Developing the ARPANET. That, of course, became the internet. Yeah. <laughs> and then later, he went to the famous Xerox Park and helped with the GUI first icons on the screen as well. Even if one person just had one of those to their name, that would yeah. be pretty remarkable. The fact that this guy was involved in, you know, three of the biggest technologies. Oh, and the precursor to Word as well. <laughs> yeah, and the word processor. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, so, you know, they do not come much bigger than that. I mean, really, you know, the, the stuff that he did even at Xerox led to like, you know, um, like the graphical user interface, Apple, Microsoft, you know, they wouldn't be around today without the work that they did back you, then. You must have been an incredibly visionary person to come up with all of those ideas and concepts and kind of, you know, help develop this GUI and visualise the computer rather than it just be text and boring numbers and data. Well, even Xerox themselves, I mean, the management, they thought it was worthless, didn't they? They gave it away for free to Apple. Yeah, yeah. So it's like... Yeah, it's a famous scene in... Um, oh, which, which film is that? Paris is that of Silicon Valley. Yeah, where, yeah. They, where they all march in and then... Ravage Xerox. Yeah, I mean, even though that movie's like looking up for 20 years old now, it's still such a good watch, isn't oh, it? Oh, totally. But uh, yeah, Robert Taylor, you know, he, when I read about this, he's a name that I was familiar with, but I didn't realise just how much he'd worked on. So um, I'm definitely keen to research his background a little bit more now and find out a yeah, bit more about it. I knew he was into the ARPANET, but I also didn't know about all the Xerox stuff. And all, it's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing that one guy was involved in, like, you know, all those technologies. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, without him, without the internet, we wouldn't be doing the show now. People wouldn't be listening to it. No, so. we'd be broadcasting locally to about 10 people. <laughs> and we probably would have given up by now. Well, we remember those days, really, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, rest in peace, Robert Taylor. If you want to learn a lot, bit more about him we will put some links in our show notes at the retrohour.com so thank you for checking out episode number 68 of the retro hour podcast and we'll be out again next week hopefully not too hungover from the british podcast awards yeah, still. let's see <laughs> let's record the show later in the week next week yeah. right, <laughs> so uh, we'll be available from all your favorite podcast clients please do keep your reviews coming in as well on itunes been a bit quiet on there again over the last couple of weeks yeah yeah give us some good ones yeah everything you know we get on any thumbs up any comments on any platform always helps the show rise up the charts and uh, you know, we really appreciate your support, guys. So we'll see you again next Friday. And now for the next 45 minutes, let's get our geek on. Let's get back some early Microsoft history, Xbox development, our special guest this week, Ed Freeze on the Retro Hour. And we'll see you next week. Yeah. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and it is time for this week's very special guest, Ed Freeze. Thank you for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. Now, before we get into your fascinating stories, I thought it would be quite nice to kind of rewind all the way back to the beginning. So what was kind of your first ever experience with a computer? Where did it all start? Wow, my first computer. I'm, you know, I'm going to have to go back to um, calculators. Can I say that? Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, you know, my dad was an electrical engineer, worked at Boeing, and he would bring home these fancy uh, calculators. And they were pretty fancy. I don't know. They cost thousands of dollars. And they would read these little mag tapes, um, HP calculators. And so you'd slide this little magnetic tape through, and that would ha have a, a couple hundred program instructions. And one of them was even a, a lunar lander game where you could pretend you were landing on the moon, which wow. was something that was actually happening back then when I was a kid. So it made it extra exciting. <laughs> but a lot of com computer companies did start with, you know, calculators. I know, like, yeah, like I said, HP, Commodore, I think, were in the calculator business as well, weren't they? Yeah, and, you know, um, my mom, she started as a chemical engineer, but then she went back to school when I was uh, about sixth grade. So about, whatever, that is, 12 years old. She got a master's in computer science. and then she, So she went to work for uh, a company called DEC, Digital Equipment Corporation. 
So um, she was probably the first one to bring real, real computers home for me to play with. Did you ever go in and see like deck mainframes and all that kind of thing then with your mom? I'm old enough that when I went to college, I went to a little school in New Mexico called New Mexico Tech. And the main reason I went there was they had a bunch of computers and they didn't have very many students. So it was really a great, a great place to, to go. Um, and uh, one of the things they had was a, it was a big Deck 20 a mainframe computer. Um, and so I did get to do some programming on that. So what was your first machine that you got your first like personal computer then? Yeah, so, um, you know... You know, 1977 or so, um, the TRS-80 and the Apple II and, and those, uh, those machines came out. Um, and I got to, you know, I would like get on my bike and ride to Radio Shack and I could play them for a few minutes before I got kicked off. But it really wasn't until um, high school, so st- starting around 1980, uh, the, the school that I went to had uh, a set of Apple IIs. Um, and, then, um, and then for Christmas that year, my dad got me an Atari 800. And that was really the computer that I spent a lot of time with when I was a kid. So did you hang around arcades as a kid as well? I did, yeah. There was a bowling alley not too far from, uh, from where uh, I grew up. And a, a bunch of kids, uh, me included, would all ride our bikes down there and play pinball and, uh, and later video games and, you know, get in trouble, that kind of thing. That must have been like a magical transition, you know, from pinball to electronic video games then. Was that, was that a very exciting time? Yeah, I don't know why. I was just uh, attracted to these machines. I mean, they were, they were kind of magical, um, even, even when they were pinball machines. Um, and uh, so, yeah, just spending time down there. I was never very good at any of them. That's one thing. That was the thing that, for me, um, was great about finding out I could, you know, write code, be a programmer, because then I could, um, you know, I could make video games, even if I was never a great player of video games, I could have fun making my own. I think you made a good point there that, you know, you didn't know why you were drawn to them, but I imagine, you know, as a kid, it's like an attack of the senses, because you've got those flashing lights and the sounds, I guess, they are kind of designed to appeal to kids, I guess, in many ways. Yeah, I suppose so. And, you know, I did grow up in a house where we had lots of electrical components and, you know, I would, you know, solder stuff together and, you know, make little things with motors and lights. And so, um, you know, you know, maybe to see the what the big boys were doing, building these big pinball machines was uh, made it extra interesting to me. So what were your favorite arcade games and which ones do you remember the most? Our, where I went to high school in Bellevue, Washington, is right next to a town called Redmond, Washington. And in Redmond, uh, it's the Nintendo North American Distribution Center. It was just down the street from where I went to, went to high school. So um, they actually stuck some video games into my high school, which they were new then and nobody knew what would happen you know, if they stuck these in a school. Uh, I'm sure they'd be banned today, but, um, you know, and, and me and a lot of other people, we just poured our lunch money into those machines, <laughs> you know. So um, I, um, the machines that we had that I really remember, we had uh, Donkey Kong, which we played a lot of, um, but we also had uh, Scramble. And Scramble was, was really fun because you could play two players. One person would be a driver. You'd kind of, the kids kind of specialized. You were either a driver or you were a gunner bomber. You know, so I was a driver. I had a I had a teammate who was a gunner bomber, and the good thing about him was he uh, he always had money, so he he could always put the quarters in the machine. So we played a lot. So you could <laughs> eat at lunch and <laughs> also play. <laughs> I still I don't remember eating much in high school. Though. I'm surprised you. Might I was eat. either there at the arcade machines or I was in the computer lab playing on the Apple IIs. You know, and that was fun too, right? I mean, I mean, we were programming, but we were also playing, you know, Choplifter and uh, Wizardry, and uh, you know, all those great games from back then. Um, and uh, that was definitely uh, one of the things, you know, where I fell even more in love with with video games, I guess. So, so that kind of inspired you to learn to program or start programming your own stuff. Yeah, and like most kids of that era. Um, you know, you start with um, magazines. That was kind of the gateway drug for um, young programmers. If you talk to anybody who kind of grew up in that time, there'd be these magazines that would come out, Antic and Creative Computing, and they'd have uh, games in BASIC. And so you'd sit there and you'd type in this long program in BASIC, and then it wouldn't work, and then you had to figure out why it didn't work. And, you know, pretty soon you had kind of in your brain sort of internalized the structure of how to, how to make a game. 
um, and then you know go from there to writing your own games first in in basic and then uh, and then into assembly language to make them actually run really well yeah magazines i mean i remember writing you know really long listings out of magazines and you know you'd get an error in there but often <laughs> the actual magazines would actually make a typo and you'd be sitting there oh, yeah. like for days wondering what you'd done wrong but it, I know. It, was good for it probably though. helped my ability to type. But I, at one point, I wrote a program to help me type in programs. You know, where I could hit one key to do each of the basic keywords. You know, I'm not I'm not sure it actually saved that much time, but it was a fun project for me to work on. <laughs> so, was it mainly games that you were making on your Atari? Then was that mainly what you were coding? Yeah, and and. Um, Mostly because uh, I couldn't think of anything else to do. You know what I mean? It's like I really fell in love with this, just the act of programming. That you know, you had, it was like a problem you solve, and then when you do it right, something comes up on the screen, something happens. You know, but what what am I going to program? You know, um, and uh, and games. You know, if you, I'm down at the arcade and I see a game like Frogger, I see Frogger, and I go, oh, that doesn't look that hard. Maybe I could make that game. You know, I go back and work on it. Um, and that was actually the, the first game that kind of got me into the real game business was uh, my version of Frogger, some, which I called Froggy. <laughs> well, uh, you also used Atari's uh, Program Exchange. What was this? Yeah, I don't know where you got that from, but that's good. Atari had a thing called Atari Program Exchange, and it was a, a way that uh, people could write programs and then send them in, and then if Atari approved them... Um, then they would um, basically publish them for you. Um, and, you know, there, there weren't any real great ways to distribute a game, especially if you're just a teenager back then. Um, so, um, yeah, the, the game that I made before Froggy, I made uh, my version of Space War, you know, kind of the classic, yeah. what I think was the first real video game. Um, and so you have a sun in the middle, and you've got ships going around the sun, and you have to do gravity and... That was that was the first game I did in assembly language, and um, and that one I submitted to Atari Program Exchange, and the funny story is I submitted it to uh, Atari Program Exchange, and I just remember it as being like this crushing experience as a kid, like the, you know, I get this letter back and they hate it, and you know, and it's fine, and then I throw it in a drawer and go on and I make my next game, which was Froggy, but uh, you know, a few years ago I found that letter, and the letter is actually. You know, looking now that I now when I read it today with my, I don't know everything I've learned. I guess I read it today and it basically says, "Hey, we really like your game and we want to publish it. And uh, if you just fix these three things, then it'll be great." Um, <laughs> you know, so it's like I guess it's all perspective. Well, after Froggy and these games you did for the um, the Atari um, Program Exchange, what was kind of your first kind of full time um, entry into the the industry? So what happened was I was a, you know, I was in my last year in high school, which I know the schools are named different in the UK. So I'm, I'm trying to explain what, what that would mean. I would be about 18 years old, like college. 17 years old, and I'd be getting ready to head off to college. Mm. Um, and um, um, and I did Froggy. And, and so I'm writing that. I'm going to school and I'm working at a pizza place. To make money, right? And the yeah. pizza place, um, oh, they had Galaxian. I love Galaxian because that was the game I would sit there late at night after we closed and play. But anyway, um, yeah, so I made this froggy game. I just made it for fun. I gave it to some friends. Somebody put it on a bulletin board. It spread around from different bulletin boards all around the country. And then uh, a, a company in California called Ramox um, saw the game, and they tracked it back to me. And somehow they found me. I have no idea to this day how they found the right Eddie Freeze, but... They, you know, they they found this high school. I mean, I'm not even in the phone book. I'm like 17, but whatever. Somehow they found me. They tracked me down. They found me, and they show up and offer me a job working for them. Right. It's like, what? I could work in a piece of place, or I could make games. Yeah, that's an easy decision, you know. So um, yeah, so I started working for them. And the first thing I did was rework uh, a Froggy to be a game called Princess and Frog. By then, I'm in college, um, getting a computer science degree, and I'm living in New Mexico. And I did two more games for them uh, in 1983 and 1984. Uh, uh, one was called Ant Eater, and then the, the last one was called Sea Chase. And um, Romux was never a really big company. There's not a lot of these cartridges out there, but you can find them on eBay. They're, they're pretty collectible now because they're so rare. But anyway, um, and then 1984 happened. And, you know, if you guys are retro podcast, you know what happened in 1984. You know, the whole game industry melted down. And uh, 
And Romox went away. A lot of game companies went away. Um, and uh, yeah, then I had to uh, like find a real job for a while. That, that must have been, was it a bit <laughs> of a shock to the system? Because I know before that it was like, it seemed like video games and the whole industry was in this kind of ascent. And then, like you said, 83, 84, it all just collapsed in North America. I mean, you must have felt a bit lost, did you, at that stage? Yeah. It's funny. I, I don't, you know, I don't remember like, I don't remember it being like this existential crisis or anything. I don't know. Maybe it was. I just don't remember it being that way. I just sort of remember moving on to something else. You know, maybe I was so, you know, a couple of years into getting my computer degree and the game stuff kind of seemed like something I was doing kind of as a lark. And at some point I'd have to get serious anyway about, you know, like get a real job when I graduated, that kind of thing. So maybe, maybe it just was a transition to that for me. So um, afterwards you kind of joined Microsoft. How did you get a job there? Yeah, so basically what happened was I, I lost my game job on the side, which was how I was paying for college. Um, so I got a job. I was a pretty good programmer, you know, if I can say that. Um, I convinced the computer science people to uh, give me a job running one of the uh, machines, uh, running a VAX 750. So I became a system administrator running one of the uh, big VAX machines, which was fun. That's a machine that had like Rogue on it, for example. So I was doing that and then I would come home for summers and, you know, so I'd look for a summer job. And um, so between basically my second and third year in college, I um, sent out a bunch of resumes and I got hired by this little company called Starcom. But as I went around and, and, and interviewed several companies before I got that job, everybody was like, uh, did you apply to Microsoft? I'm like, who's Microsoft? You know, like, you mean like the guys who make the mouse? I mean, they didn't, they weren't really known that well. They made basic and the mouse and that was about it in the early eighties. Hmm. So the next summer, because so many people told me the summer before the next summer that I should apply to Microsoft, the next summer I sent a resume to Microsoft and they, um, they immediately like flew me up to Microsoft, which was exciting. I got a free flight, and I got to get a whole day of job interview, and then um, and then they offered me a job, uh, and so I worked there uh, that summer, summer of '85, uh, as an intern, and they liked the job that I did, and offered me a job to come back full time in '86 uh, when I when I graduated. Being a recent graduate, what was the the culture like at Microsoft when you went there? Then was it like pretty serious, or was it quite laid back? Or? <laughs> That's a great question, um, because you know I had fun that summer. That's that summer when I was a, an intern, um, I was in charge of what was called the um, the the basically the DOS computer based training software, and so um, every DOS game that they shipped you know, these character-based games had a, a fancy tutorial that went with it that taught you how to use it and took you through all these lessons. And and, and, and there was a, a group of writers and artists that created these tutorials using this internal tool. Um, and so they they didn't have anyone to deal with that because all the, all the real programmers were working on this new thing called Windows. So they were building a whole new uh, tutorial system for getting ready for the first release of Windows that happened at the end of that summer of 85. Um, and so uh, the intern gets the job of, of, of maintaining the old system. Well, that was awesome for me because I had my own whole thing I was in charge of and all my customers were uh, artists and, and writers that were just down the hall from me. So they would come and say, hey, can you add this feature? And I'd go and add it and and they'd love it, you know. And to them it was like magic, you know. So it was like being the magician in the group that could make stuff happen. They were happy, I was happy. But what was Microsoft like then? It was before Microsoft had gone public and, you know, all, a lot of people were, were kind of moaning and groaning. It was like, oh, we work so hard and we don't get paid that well and all this stuff. There was a guy, there was this experienced programmer, his name's C.B. Layerly. And I used to go to his office on Fridays just for fun. And I would just like, I could just like set him off. You know, I learned after a few weeks that if I just said a few things, you know, like I mentioned the word windows or something else, then he would just go off on a rant for like 30 <laughs> minutes. And I could just sit back and just listen to him rant about, you know, how screwed up things are and how unhappy he is and all that stuff. So anyway... So that was my experience. I personally had a good time there, but I heard a lot of grumbling. 
And, um, and so when I graduated, you know, um, I did apply to a bunch of other companies, um, and I got three different job offers and I really considered hard about whether I should, um, whether I should go back to Microsoft or not. You know, it was in my hometown. It was easy. And then my brother and sister and my, you know, mom and dad would be nearby and, and it was a place I already understood. It ended up being the easy choice. And so I, I ended up taking it, but I kind of felt like, oh, I'm, I'm making sort of the easy choice. Uh, I get back there and it was like walking into a completely different place. You know, from the time that I left that fall to the time that I was, you know, joining that's the next summer, the company had built out their first corporate campus, these four beautiful buildings around this big pond. They had gone public and all these, all these programmers who were whining about, you know, being unhappy for, you know, being underpaid and all this sudden had made a ton of money on this stock options that they had had, that they had thought were worthless. Um, so they're all walking around with big smiles and whistling. And I'm thinking, man, I got here too late. <laughs> you know, 86, it's all over. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what it felt like. You know, but, in, the, uh, in those kind of early days, was, uh, was Bill Gates quite approachable? Did you have much interaction with him? Yeah, yeah I, it's funny. I kind of had a similar amount of interaction with him almost the entire 20 years that I worked there. Um, you know, I, I started as an intern and I left as a vice president. And But there were always, you know, two or three layers of management between him and me. And he was always an approachable guy. Like he would he would have all the interns over to his house uh, for, for a party every summer and get to know the interns and... Uh, and that really never changed the whole time I, I was there. Um, so I knew him from the very beginning, and I would see him several times a year all, all through the time that I was there. But I was never I, – I never worked directly for him, which I think might – he might be a little intense for that. I'm not sure I would have enjoyed that. Well, you started working on Excel and Word. Was it hard going up against, uh, you know, Lotus 1, 2, 3 and Word Perfect because they were so dominating at the time? You know, it was exciting, actually, because, I mean, there were just seven of us working on the first version of Excel for Windows when I joined. And it was really a different experience than my, you know, my summer internship. My summer internship, I was pretty much on my own. And I was, you know, a pretty confident, self-motivated programmer, maybe overly confident, you know. And all of a sudden, I was thrown on this team with some really excellent people. And I learned so much that that first year. Um, you know, I'm working on this big program. It seemed huge at the time. There were seven other, you know, seven people counting me that were all working on parts of it. Um, I was kind of the understudy to the what's, what's called the technical lead, who's kind of the lead programmer. And so I got to work on parts all over the program. And I got to learn from this guy who was who was super smart. His name was Mark O'Brien. Um, and, uh, it was great. I just, I, I only have, I only have great memories of that time The you know, our, our manager was great. The team was great. The mission was great. We had this big, you know, from our point of view, kind of lazy old successful company out there and we were the young upstarts and there was just seven of us that were going to beat them and with this make a better product, you know, what else could you ask for? I mean, it was really a great situation. You know, and over time we did beat them, and that was uh, that made it made it really fun. You could tell that you had, you know, you guys had attitude because you even put like a, an anti Lotus Easter egg into Excel. <laughs> well, what happened there? <laughs> so that's a few years later, a few ver versions later. You know, we were. You can tell we were focused on. I mean, Lotus was. You know, when I joined Microsoft, Lotus was bigger than all of Microsoft. I mean, Lotus was the number one software company. Microsoft was number two. So they are, you know, if we could beat them with Excel, it would be really important. Um, and, and so we were always focused on them. They were the enemy. You know, when I said it, when I graduated from, uh, from college, I sent out resumes to a bunch of people. Uh, I sent one to Lotus and I got a rejection letter from them. And, and so that was kind of a prized possession. I would keep that up, on, you know, <laughs> on, on my wall as I worked. I could look up and see, you know. The, the rejection letter from the people who from Lotus. These are the guys I want to beat, you know. But it, but to answer your question about the Easter egg, every version of Excel had Easter eggs. You know, after a few years, I became the technical lead. So I was like, now I'm the lead programmer. By then, there's 50 programmers working on this team. It's a lot bigger. And yeah, one night I had this dream, and in my dream there was a box of Lotus One Two Three, and it shakes, and then it just kind of starts to break apart, and bugs 
crawl out <laughs> and crawl around the box. And so, uh, you know, I came into work that next morning. I'm like, I know what our Easter egg's going to be. And so, so we, we, we made that the Easter egg for that version of Excel. Were they pretty laid back about that kind of thing, or did you just keep it quiet? <laughs> I would say pretty laid back. Um, there, it, there was always uh, sort of a plausible deniability. Like there would be a big routine in the code that said Easter egg, you know, <laughs> and it would be, you know, all the code to be to do the Easter egg. But but then the the, the deniability came. There was never you never see anywhere in the rest of the code a call to that function. There was never anywhere that called Easter egg. And so you can say, well, yeah, we have the, that, but it never gets called. You know, look through the code yourself. Well, there's tens of thousands of lines of code, maybe millions of lines. We always had a really clever way that we did, that we that we ended up calling this routine. So it was always hit, the the call was hidden, even if the code was right there in plain sight. I remember um, the Easter eggs at Excel keeping me entertained in IT lessons. <laughs> like, oh, look, you can do this. Wasn't there like games in some of them, wasn't there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. After I moved from there to Word, they get, they just kept getting more and more complicated. They did a flight simulator in one. They did they did kind of a Doom clone in another <laughs> one. So they were they were always doing fun stuff. Well, obviously, in the mid '90s, I mean, you had you know arguably the biggest change in uh, you know technology in the in the '90s was the release of Windows '95. I mean. What was the mood like at Microsoft when that was released? You know, that I remember as being, it was like flipping a switch. It was like night and day. I mean, before Windows 95, let's say I'm, I'm riding on an airplane and the guy next to me says, what, what do you do? And it's like, I work at Microsoft. And they're like, who's that? Well, you know, nobody, nobody knew who the company was. And I swear, the day after that Windows 95 released, Everyone knew who Microsoft was, and all of a sudden it was like this big kind of famous story. I don't know. It, it just it, it, it really it was really a big turning point for the company. I can't I can't stress how important it was. And you know the launch was really big, and Jay Leno was there, and he did this big thing. And I don't know. It was just all these things all happened all at once, and all of a sudden Microsoft was just a household name. Well, even though you're working on you know these uh, serious applications, I mean, did you still hold your interest in games during this time? Yeah, I was. I mean, you know, that's the the two things that that I've I've been in love with since I was a kid is programming and and video games. And so, yeah, you know, I'd be I'd be at work working hard on a spreadsheet, and then I'd come home and uh, I'd play all the latest games. Um, you know, and there were fantastic games during that time. So many so many genres were invented in the early '90s. Uh, you know, uh, you had the first real time strategy, you had the first uh, first true, you know, PC first person shooter, your first survival horror game. Um, you kind of kind of go on and on and on with the games that came out then. Uh, it was really when the, the genres were first established that we live with today. Well, how did you move from office then to games? <laughs> that's that's like the big question. How does he get from here to there, right? <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I mean, part of it was I was, you know, as I was kind of getting promoted in Microsoft, I got to the point where um, where I was going to have to give up, you know, the thing that I loved about my job. I mean, you know, I think I was an okay manager. I could, you know, I could do that stuff, but I didn't really enjoy it. I mean, what I enjoyed was programming. And, you know, I got to the point where I was going to have to basically be a pure manager. Um, and, uh, you know, if I was going to do that, what would what would it be like? Would I even just like my job? Um, and then I found out that there was they were looking for someone to run Microsoft's game business. And it was pretty small back then. It was Flight Simulator and not too much else. And I'm like, ah, oh, this is the job I want to have. I want to then I can. Then, I, you know, if I have to give up programming, which I love, I can at least do the management business thing in a space that, that I also love, which is games. And, and, and it was also sort of moving on to the next battle for me. You know, Excel was a fun battle. Word versus Word Perfect was a fun battle. But we were, you know, basically nowhere in, in the gaming space. And so that was a chance for me to, um, you know, to fight a new war for Microsoft. So... So I said to my bosses, I, you know, I found this job. I, 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 the people who had the job open offered it to me, and they said, uh, they, you know, uh, that I could have it. And so then I went to my bosses and I said, Hey, I found a, my next job. I really want to go do this job. 
And, uh, and they told me, and they, 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 multiple vice presidents hauled me into their office. They said I was committing career suicide. And they said, <laughs> one of them said to me, why would you leave office one of the most important parts of the company to go work on something no one cares about? <laughs> That's like a direct quote. And, uh, you know, I was like, I care about games, you know. They must have thought you were crazy at the time. <laughs> you know, you know, a bunch of the vice presidents in particular thought I was crazy. I think Bill didn't think I was crazy because Bill, uh, although he didn't, he didn't, in this particular instance, he, I, I didn't hear an opinion from him one way or another. But he was, he was a little bit of a closet gamer himself. Me and a few other people, we would draw this little chart. We'd be like, we'd be like, here, let me show you the the 24 hours of the day of a typical customer. You know, they spend a third of it sleeping, they spend a third of it at work, and they spend a third of it at home. And we're doing really good when they're at work, Microsoft is, and the third when they're asleep is a pretty tough market for selling software. Um, so what about that other third of their, of their day? You know, we should, we should have products for that time too. Um, you know, and that, that argument um, worked for some people anyway. So. So what was kind of the first things, your, your initial goals and the first things you worked on then when you got into the gaming department? You know, I got in there and I, I almost immediately felt like I was, you know, I, it's like it was stressful when I made the decision because a bunch of people were telling me I was doing the wrong thing. And, um, you know, I didn't know. It was like a big career step for me. Um, and it was a big job. It was a different job. Like I knew I was a good programmer, but could I run this you know, business. I didn't. I don't have an MBA. I don't. I didn't know a lot of this stuff. Um, and and uh, when I first got into the job, um, you know, uh, after about three months, my boss quit. And so then I was reporting to my boss's boss. And after about three more months, that boss quit. And then so for a while, I'm reporting to my boss's boss's boss. And I really have no idea how to do my job. You know, it's all like spreadsheets and like. I mean, I knew how to work on spreadsheets, but I didn't really know how to read spreadsheets. But, uh, you know, it's like, oh, here's a PL. Oh, what's a PL? Oh, it's a profit and loss statement. Oh, well, what does that mean? You know, anyway, and, you know, people were coming into my office asking me to make decisions. Oh, we need a million dollars to do this new game. It's like, you know, I go to my boss. It's like, somebody just asked me for a million dollars. What do I do? You know, <laughs> and, and my boss is like, well, you know. If it's under this certain amount, which back then was about $5 million, they said it was basically up to you. Look at it, get all the information you want, and then make the decision. I'm like, okay. <laughs> um, so I was really kind of running without a safety net. And, uh, but I had a great team. That was one thing. I got there and I found this just great team of people were there. And they, they had, um, you know, they, like me, were true gamers. They really wanted to expand Microsoft's position in the gaming world. And I kind of got there, you know, at the right time with the right people. And, um, and then we just put out a whole bunch of PC games over the next five years. And it was a fantastic time. I mean, you know, cause as a gamer, I'm like, okay, you know, who do I respect? Uh, you know, um, and then we just go out and, and meet with them and try to sign them up. And, you know, sometimes they were deals that I could put together really quickly um, you know, so I'm working with like Chris Taylor, Chris Roberts, or, uh, you know, meeting with Sid Meier, meeting with, you know, going to Japan, meeting with a bunch of companies there. We ended up doing some work with Konami everywhere. Uh, Peter Molyneux, which later led to work working with him. I met with the Stanford brothers and later ended up working with them. You know, it just kind of was like, I mean, what would you do if you're like a, a gamer? Would you just go to all the developers in the world that you really respect and try to put deals together with them. I mean, like a kid in a candy that, shop, yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's what it was like. You know, I had a pretty good set of resources. In other words, I had Flight Simulator was like this rock for us. It was a product that we could put out, you know, year in and year out. It had a, it had a steady audience and it was always profitable for us. And so we had money coming in from that that we could then reinvest in, in these other more experimental things and see what would work. You know, when I came in, um, they had just started working with a, a little company out of Texas called Ensemble Studios. They were making their first um, real-time strategy game. You know, and I was a big, uh, you know, a Dune 2 Command and Conquer player. And so I, that was probably the game I was most excited about when I was first interviewing over there, seeing that, that they were going to do their own real-time strategy game. And, you know, we put that game out the next year. Um, it, it was called Age of Empires. Um, and that became a huge franchise for us. And so that, between Flight Sim and Age of Empires, um, 
you know, those were sort of our two rocks for building the PC business going forward. Well, um, Microsoft also had some involvement with the uh, Sega Dreamcast console. Did you learn anything from that? Yeah. So again, something I had, that's something I had zero to do with. And I, I'm kind of proud of that. <laughs> you know, um, that was, that was an initiative out of the system side of the company. And it was out of, um, the group that's called, uh, Windows CE. There was a, a group that was making a, a small version of Windows that was embeddable into, uh, into devices rather than running on big, you know, uh, desktop PCs. And, um, you know, they were out looking for possible, uh, places where they could put lots of copies of this embeddable version of Windows. And they kind of twisted Sega's arm and, and, and got them to put it into the Dreamcast. You know, there's a little sticker on a lot of Dreamcast if people didn't peel them off that said Windows CE. But I don't know anyone who ever actually booted it into Windows CE mode, and I'm not sure what you could have, could do with it when it was there. Maybe there was a game or two that would run there. You know, I, I do remember them coming to my group at that time and asking if we would make um, some games for it, and I basically told them no. Um, you know, we were very focused on the PC market at that time. We were growing our market share in PC. Our, you know, we were thinking of our competitors as being people like Electronic Arts. You know, that's somebody that we really looked up uh, up to, and and so we would compare our market share to theirs and and try to beat them in certain categories, including including uh, racing and sports where they were really strong. Well, you did touch on, obviously, the next part of this story, which is the Xbox. So when did the idea of coming up with a Microsoft console come about then, and how did you become the, the lead on that? So what happened was a couple guys from the DirectX team um, came over to meet with me one day, and I, I'm not sure exactly which who which guys were in that group. You know, Seamus was over there, Seamus Blackley, and um, uh, a guy named Otto Burks was there, and, and several others. But um, basically, I just remember a group of these guys coming into my office, and um, you know, by then that was a couple years after I had had that Windows CE conversation. My my attitude was starting to change. We were, you know, we were we were getting to where, you know, about as high as we could sort of hope to be in, in the Windows uh, gaming uh, market share. And, you know, it was getting harder and harder to get, get a little bit bigger. Um, but console was just this wide open world where, the, where we had no presence at all. And, um, and, you know, by then we had kind of established ourselves, at least as PC game makers, you know, could we take those skills and apply them to console? But console seems so different. And so, you know, we knew so little about it. It just seemed like a big stretch to get in, into it. And then these guys walk in my office and they say to me basically, hey, we want to build a console. You know, we're from the DirectX team. It's basically the DirectX box, but we'll, we just call it Xbox for short. Um, and what it's going to be is going to be a PC on the inside. So it's going to be exactly like the system that you and all your developers are used to developing for, but it's going to behave like a console. It's going to have the user friendliness of a console. You know, no more installing games and dealing with all this operating system stuff that breaks all the time. You know, it'll just be like a consumer appliance. You turn it on, you put in a disc, and it plays. Behind the scenes, it'll be running Windows, it'll install the thing, but you just it just won't show you that it's installing it. And from the, the consumer experience, uh, will be just like a game console. And so that was a very appealing idea to me because it was like, okay, wow, we could just take all, all our PC franchises and we could just put them over. Our, you know, we could do flight sim on this thing. We could do, um, you know, Age of Empires on this thing. We could do other stuff that we're doing on this thing, which is incredibly naive point of view and not where we ended up at all. But they were naive in this whole like thing they were proposing too. So anyway, that was. But that's how you know ideas start. You know, they usually like start wrong and then they sort of evolve with time and and experience. Hopefully. Um, to get to somewhere where you're, it's the actual product you want to build. So there was no kind of idea of this multimedia home entertainment unit as well? Though. You know, that whole multimedia thing was never at the core of Xbox. That, was real, that really came in from marketing people later who got involved who were, were not really gamers, and you can tell that. You know, that was, all that messaging always fell flat with gamers, and we were like, I told you it would, would fall flat. You know? Like, you know, the, the, core, the core people building um, 
you know, first evang- evangelizing it, people like Seamus, a big gamer, um, you know, Jay Allard on the system software side, me, me on the game side, you know, we were all, we were all gamers. We didn't, we didn't want to use it to, um, watch movies or other stuff. I mean, that was a bonus, right? If you could have it as a DVD player, but it certainly wasn't what we thought the core function of the machine was. Well, as the Xbox idea developed, um, I heard there was one stage where you had a pretty brutal meeting with Bill Gates on uh, on Valentine's Day. <laughs> what exactly happened there? <laughs> Valentine's Day massacre. That's what the meeting came to be known as. Here's how. Here's how I remember it. I've seen. I've seen it told several different ways now, and uh, I still think mine is the, what really happened. But anyway, so actually, so I have to step back a year. So go back a year. Basically, I teamed up with this DirectX group and tried to help them uh, push forward this idea of this console that really runs Windows, that's really a PC, blah, blah, blah. At the same time, there was another competing group within the company that that was the continuation of that uh, Sega Dreamcast Windows CE group. And they and their proposal said that our proposal was totally wrong. They said, no, we should build a custom device just like a PlayStation 1 uh, that only runs games and it's, you know, custom operating system, custom, custom, custom. So anyway, those two groups rose all the way up to the very top of Microsoft. They each had their own group of vice presidents surrounding these ideas, kind of in Microsoft fashion. And then they got all the way up to Bill and Steve and there was a big battle and we won. Um, and and we won basically because um, we being Xbox won because our plan was more on strategy. It was a more of a Microsoft plan, okay? Because we were running Windows, which so we were leveraging other things inside the company and blah blah blah. After that, after we won that meeting, won uh, the, that Windows CE group kind of got broken up, and some of some of the people came to work in, in, in Xbox and contributed to that. Anyway, we went off and we spent a year really looking at the problem. And over that year, our point of view changed quite a bit on a bunch of these things, and we drifted somewhere back more towards the middle between those two extremes of it's really just a PC running Windows. And and the other side, which is it's this pure custom thing, but we we drifted pretty far, you know, away. So to by the end, yeah, maybe there's a little kernel of Windows in there, but it's not at all running Windows. But it still has an Intel processor. The basic architecture is still a PC architecture. It still has a hard disk, which is something we had in the plan from the very beginning. Blah blah blah. Okay, so you got to understand all that before you go into this meeting. So the meeting was the first time we basically presented to Bill and Steve this year worth of of work leading up to to making this this machine. And it was when we were going to get final permission to go forward and spend a lot of money, um, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. So so we go into the meeting and it's a big, important bill meeting room. And, um, you know, we're all sitting around the table. It's probably 20 people in there. And Bill locks in and he throws our PowerPoint deck. He's got a printed copy of the PowerPoint deck. He throws it down the table and he says, this is an insult to everything that I've been involved with at this company. <laughs> that was like the opening of the meeting. It was like, whoa, you know, and, and, you know, a lot of us had worked with him over a lot of years and we had seen him kind of go over the top a little bit and, you know, but, but still it was, that was like, okay. And, and you know, so that happened. So, and we knew why he was mad. He was mad because we had told him it was going to run windows and he had just found out that it wasn't actually going to run windows. And so some of the whole reason that he had picked our team a year before were now gone. We all looked at Jay Allard because he was in charge of the operating system. And uh, and Jay doesn't look kind of like a deer in the headlights after Bill had said that and, you know, in a sort of dramatic fashion. So then I tried to say something, being the other kind of technical guy in the room. And uh, and Bill shoots me down. And then and then my boss, Robbie Bach, tries to say something. And, and Bill yells at him. And then by then, Jay's got his legs. And Jay argues with him. And then he yells at him. And it just kind of goes back and forth like that for hours, you know, and then Balmer starts to join in and Balmer, cause Balmer's looking at the business plan and the business plan says, we're going to lose a lot of money over the, over the next five years of this project. It's going to cost a lot of money. We're not going to make that much money. Um, and, um, so he's yelling about that and, and, um, Bill's yelling about the technical stuff like he often does. And, and, um, you know, it just, 
we, you know, it was four o'clock on Valentine's Day. It was five o'clock. It was six o'clock. It was seven o'clock on Valentine's Day. <laughs> We're basically just saying the same thing over and over again. We're like, hey, we looked at this for a year. We're very confident that if you want to go into this business, this is the plan to do it. We agree with you. It's going to cost a lot of money, that you're not going to make a lot of money. We agree with that. But we, we're quite sure that if you want to do this, this is the way to do it. And, and we just basically say variations of that over and over and over again. But anyway, it's 7 o'clock. It's heading towards 8 o'clock. And we're all, you know, we're all looking at our watches because we have like dinner reservations that we've missed. And you know, we're all in trouble with our spouses at home you know, because we're stuck in this meeting from hell where we're getting yelled at you know, <laughs> by the two most powerful people in the tech world. And so then, like right around, I don't know, it seems like it was right around 8 o'clock at night, this one guy, Craig Mundy, who'd been very quiet up till then, um, it, Craig had sort of this conspiracy theory that Sony was slowly taking over the living room and sort of infiltrating the home through a series of products that if any one of them you looked at by itself, it might not be much of a threat. But if you imagine them networked together, you could almost kind of see that they had sort of put a PC together by putting different little parts in each of these products that were all becoming popular in people's houses. And, and his point of view was that that was a real threat to Microsoft and Microsoft's ability to get out of the home office and spread out to other places in the home. And he, and he had sent many memos around, uh, you know, for, for months or even years about this. So he didn't need to say all that. All he said was, what about Sony? And um, Bill repeats it. Bill says, yeah, what about Sony? <laughs> and then Balmer repeats Bill, you know, <laughs> What about Sony? <laughs> and they look at each other, and it was kind of a pause. And then Bill says, "We should do this." And Balmer says, "Yeah, I, I agree. We should do this." And then, and then they're getting excited. They're going back and forth. Yeah, we should give these guys everything they're asking for. We, you know, we're asking for a lot of money. We're asking to be like left alone from the rest of the company to basically go off strategy and build this stuff that's completely unlike any other part of Microsoft. To be like have the freedom to not be part of the rest of the company and to do things the way we want to do them and all this stuff. And they're like, we're going to, we're going to do this. We're going to give you guys everything you're asking for. Um, you, you guys should go do this. You know, we, we're going to give you everything, go do it. And that part of the meeting lasted about five minutes. Okay. <laughs> and, um, and we walked out of there my head, I just, my head was spinning, you know, I just, and I turned to, to Robbie and I just like, that was the weirdest meeting I've been in in 15 years in this company. <laughs> you know, that was that's what I said to him. You know, but that was that was the start of Xbox. And then, uh, you know, a few months later, uh, you know, game developers conference. Bill was up on stage showing our prototype and announcing to the world we're doing Xbox. And and from then it was just a mad sprint. Less than two years between then and when we launched in uh, 2001. And for my group in particular, that was. Well, I, I shouldn't say this. I, I mean, everybody, everybody had an impossible job to do. I mean, games take three years to make, did at that time anyway, and now sometimes more. And, um, you know, we had less than two years. Jay's team had to build the entire operating system from scratch, basically. And Todd Holmdahl had to build all the hardware. I mean, had to build this whole machine. And so it was, a, it was an incredible effort to try to get this whole thing out. Uh, you know, in, in my case, you know, fortunately, we were able to put a deal together for this thing called Halo, and that, that really made, made it all work out. But. Well, talking of Halo, then, when was, when was the first time you actually saw Halo? So a few months later, um, I got a call from a guy named Peter Tampty. And um, Peter, I had run into at a couple game events uh, over the years, and he was the business guy at Bungie. I was a fan of their work. I had played some of their, their games on the PC, not on the Mac, but uh, when, when they later put st some stuff on the PC. And so I knew who they were and I had respect for them. So anyway, he called me and he tells me this story that basically the company is uh, going out of business. It was a story I, I had heard a lot from a lot of game companies about that time. Uh, it was kind of the end of the developer-publisher, at least at that, at that point of view, that 
developers who would make their own games and then do their own distribution to sell them. And uh, it was just distribution had gotten too expensive and complicated for kind of mom and pop shops to do at that time. And so uh, he told me they were, they were going to, they were out of money. They were going to go out of business. Um, that Take Two already owned a third of them, and that Take Two was going to buy the rest of them unless somebody else was interested. And that, and he mentioned Halo. He said they have this thing called Halo. And I said, well, I'm interested. Um, definitely, let's talk. You know, I have less than two two years to pull together a content lineup. Um, and uh, here's a developer calling me that I really respect. You know, some people from my team went out to meet with them, and um, that was basically where it started. And that, you know, after a couple months, it became clear that uh, the thing that we really wanted was Halo. Um, and so um, I dealt with a, uh, a guy named Ryan Brandt, who ran Take Two, and Ryan and I basically split up the company. And I gave him um, all the back catalog of Bungie stuff, and I said, "We'll finish Oni for you, uh, another Bungie game." And then um, once it's shipped, I'm going to take all those developers. And then I'm going to take the rest of the developers who are working on Halo. So basically, I'm just going to get Halo and all the developers, and you're going to get everything else. That was the deal we made. Um, <laughs> it turned out to be a good deal for me. Did you ever um, think it would be the hit that it was going to be? Um, we loved that game internally. Uh, and it got, it, it got more internal play than anything else that we were developing. But... Uh, we were PC developers, and then they were. We were PC game publishers and and developers as well, and they were a PC developer, and so it made sense that it made sense to us. You know what I mean? It's like a networked multiplayer first person shooter was a PC genre then. It really wasn't a console genre. You had Goldeneye, uh, which you know, but but. Beyond that, you really didn't have examples on the console. And when we, whenever we met with the press and tried to get them excited about this game, um, they basically looked at us like this was kind of like our worst fear. You know, you're a bunch of PC people trying to enter a, the console world you don't understand, and you're making PC content. You know, where's your Mario? Why, why does it look so gray? Where, you know, where are the bright colors? You, know, you guys clearly don't understand the market you're going into. That was the message we were hearing back. We, would sh we showed it at E3, uh, two E3s we got in there, uh, first kind of an announcement and then, and then the final showing. And both of those didn't go very well. We chose to show multiplayer th that second E3, and that was tough because we were running on um, half-speed Xboxes. We didn't have the full-speed hardware yet. And so it was framey, and um, you know, uh, we, we, we really got mixed, mixed signals from people. Well, I shouldn't just say mixed signals. We got negative signals from, from the gaming press that they, they weren't buying this game. But we were, you know, we were playing early builds of it, and we were really falling in love with this thing. We thought it was great. So you know, we kind of came into launch in a, it, it, you know, it was, it was one of a couple games that we were going to really feature hard. Another one was Munch's Odyssey, uh, but Munch was a lot easier, uh, easier sell because you know here's a game developer that we stole away from Sony. It was a franchise that people, you know, knew already. The Odd World franchise. Lorne Lanning was an incredible spokesperson. You know, anytime he got up in front of the gamer press, they loved this guy. Um, and so, uh, you know, going into launch, if you ask people to place their money on which of those two games, you know, you, there might be a bigger pile on Munch than there'd be there'd be on Halo. But as soon as we launched, it became clear that Halo was the runaway, you know, reason to buy an Xbox, and it really helped define what the personality of Xbox was, what the box was all about. Well, let's talk about the launch then, because Xbox was launched on November fifteenth, two thousand one. What do you remember about that day? So, yeah, so first of all, the launch was a week late. We, uh, the reason it was a week late was because of 2000, uh, because of September 11th, mm -hmm. 2001. So you got to remember that that happened just a few months before our launch. Um, you know, you had the World Trade Towers blown up. We were all over the all over the world. Our team at that time. I was down in San Francisco when that happened. It took me days to be able to get back to Seattle. Seamus and my boss, Robbie Bach, were both in New York City when that happened. Um, and and uh, Robbie ended up renting a car with some other people and driving all the way across America uh, from New York to Seattle. Um, but so we were happy that in the end, it only delayed 
uh, our launch one one week. Uh, and we had other things like, you know, we were building a racing game called Project Gotham Racing. Well, guess what? It took place in New York City. So we had the Twin Towers. Do we leave them in? Do we take them out? Um, you know, we're dealing with PR crisis The you know, the, the, uh, the terrorist had used flight simulator, our product to train for this thing. Anyway, it was, it was, that was, that was a dark shadow over those last few months. Uh, but by the time, you know, we got to launch, everything was buttoned up and we were really happy about it. And we basically had a big launch event, uh, in New York city. Um, and so that's, I was out there and Robbie was out there. Bill Gates was out there and it was in Times Square. Um, there was a, a, a new Toys R Us that, that hadn't actually opened yet, but it was right there on Times Square. And so we had made a deal to, uh, use that to give out the very first, uh, Xboxes to sell the very first Xboxes. And we had bought out all the big signs in Times Square, all the electronic signs. And so... I just remember, you know, walking over to the midnight launch of that and seeing Xbox up on all these signs. And there was, you know, a huge crowd of people. But because it was so close to September 11th, the police were freaking out. They had all these rules that you couldn't have too many people in any one spot at any time. And they were so they were letting making our line, you know, letting us only have so many people in line. And then we had to have people other places. And anyway, it was just this weird kind of combination of, of things. And then at midnight, you know, I didn't have anything I actually had to do, but I got to be there and watch, you know, Bill sell the very first Xbox. Um, Seamus, being the showman he, he, he was, uh, uh, proposed to his wife, uh, Van Burnham, that night. Um, and uh, it, was just a, it was just a wild, wild night. Um, and uh, just a great, a great way to, um, to celebrate all the hard work that we had done over the years coming into that moment. Well, to kind of sum up and honor that, you... Um did a demake of Halo for the Atari 2600. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're running out of time. We gotta, gotta get to that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was years later, and uh, you know, I I, I did that uh, in 2010. You know, I had worked on the Atari 800 back in the day. Yeah, kind of in in late 2009, I was at a, speaking at a game conference. And I had mentioned working on the Atari, and somebody came up to me afterwards and said, have you seen this this new book called Racing the Beam? And uh, I hadn't, so I read this book, and it's all about working on the Atari 2600. And it turns out I, I never knew how spoiled I was working on the 800. I mean, the 800 has four monochrome sprites and four missiles and, and uh, 48K of RAM, while the 2600 has two monochrome sprites and two missiles um, and 128 bytes of RAM. And it's incredibly constrained machine, incredibly, incredibly difficult. But that's kind of like the fun challenge for, for at least a certain kind of sick programmer like me, you know. So I read this book and, um, you know, I hadn't written 6502 code in a long time, but I'm like, hey, I wonder if I could do this. So um, there were some easy to find tools on the internet and I got set up and, um, I'm like, well, what am I going to do? You know, it was a like, a lot like the old days I'd, where I'd be in the arcade and I'd see a game and then I'd go back and I'd, I'd program it. I was like, okay, maybe I'll try to do the master chief. So I drew a little eight bit master chief in paint. And then I tried to make it show that on the screen, uh, in an Atari 2600 emulator. And, you know, after after a week or so of work, I got it to show. And then I'm like, OK, well, maybe I can make it move around. And so I made it so I could move around. And maybe I, then I added so I could shoot. Then I added some little enemies to, sh- to, to shoot and to have shoot back at me. And that's basically where I was by March. And uh, I went to the Game Developers Conference like I almost always do. And just while I was at that conference, I happened to run into a guy named Mike Micah and Chris Charla, and they were standing there with a guy named Todd Fry, and I knew Todd Fry as the guy who created the original 2600 Pac-Man, and um, and so we're, you know, we're just talking, and they're like, what are you working on? I said, oh, I'm just screwing around with this little Halo guy on the Atari 2600, and they're like, what? (laughs) You're making Halo on the 2600? And they're like, you've got to do that. And I'm like, no, I'm just screwing around. I just have this little thing just for fun. And they're like, no, no, you have to make that game. And I'm like, I do? And they're like, yeah, you have to make it. 
and like, okay, I guess I have to make it, you know? So I came back from GDC with this sort of mission that I had to make this game, actually make it be a real game. And basically worked on it, and I set the goal of releasing it at the Classic Gaming Expo uh, that summer, and that's what I was able to do. Um, you know, it's 4K hand assembly, 4,000 bytes. I ran out of near the end, and, uh, you know, I've got 64 rooms. It's basically like kind of a mashup of, of Halo meets Adventure. You know, you, you go from room to room and battle these creatures, and uh, there's keys you have to find and unlock things. And I try to, I try to put little Halo flavor all through it, uh, you know, and released it. And, uh, yeah, that's where it came from. It's great that you went full circle, though, back to the Atari again. That's some of magic about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, fun stuff. Ed, we, we could get your stories all night. You know, we've really appreciated you joining us this week. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your, uh, your stories of your amazing adventures at Microsoft and much more. Uh, it's been great talking to you guys. Thank you so much. And if people want to keep up to date with you, do you tweet or anything like that? Yeah, you know, I've been doing a lot of uh, stuff lately with uh, some of the earliest arcade machines. Um, and you can see that on my, uh, my blog, edfreeze.wordpress.com. Um, and I just released an article about the very, very first Easter egg ever, the earliest one known ever, from a game called Starship One. So if you haven't seen that article, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's called uh, Chasing the First Video Game Easter Egg, something like that. <laughs> I don't even know what I call it. But anyway, it's on edfreeze.wordpress.com. After you read it, you'll wish you asked me about it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe next time. Exactly. And thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks again, guys.